Okay, so today we're going to have two presentations. Uh, the first is going to be from Tom Turner, Tom Turner and Gregor Hamilton about crayfish work that they're going to be doing um, in the Gila River Basin. And then the second discussion today is going to be presented by Matt Troya and Jennifer Smith, um, also about uh, crayfish distribution analysis. Um, so we'll get through those um, in about 40 minutes here today. Um, next month, we'll have two additional presentations. Um, one by Merrill Nems from Virginia Tech, um, talking about SmartSim or a, a model to help optimize bullfrog control in Southern Arizona. And then we'll also have a presentation by uh, Rebecca Smith and David Ward on exploring the use of ammonia for crayfish eradication. So with that, I think I'll go ahead and hand it over to uh, Tom and Gregor. If, um, whoever's going to present, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, we'll get you going. And uh, Gregor's going to do the presentation, but um, I'm going to start just by introducing myself. And um, my name's Tom Turner. I'm a professor at the University of New Mexico. I've been working in the Southwest for about 23 years uh, on native fish and conservation issues. We do ecology and we do genetics in our lab and we're interested in the interaction of those two things. But what you're gonna to see today is a strictly ecological study. Um, and um, I just wanted to uh, share my appreciation to the group for funding this study. We're really, uh, this is uh, perfect timing. Uh, Gregor Hamilton, who will be doing the presentation is a doctoral student in my lab and he's been working on this problem for a couple of years now. So we're very interested in sort of taking this to the next level and really translating some of the results that he's gotten to management applications. So I'll turn it over to Gregor and let him go. All right, can everybody see the presentation correctly? Yep, looks like a Gregor. Cool. Well, thanks for the introduction, Tom and Matt. I uh, appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk today about our proposal, population dynamics and community interactions of invasive crayfish and protected fishes and reptiles in the Gila River Basin. Uh, as Tom said, I'm a PhD student in his lab, which is the Turner Aquatic Conservation Lab. Uh, very interested in working together with management, both to inform the science that we conduct and help drive the management strategies that managers uh, undertake with the best available science. Um, I've been interested in crayfish since I was an undergrad at Western New Mexico University. Um, and it's really, really delightful to be doing my dissertation work with crayfish in the Gila. So specifically with our project, we were gearing uh, uh, our studies towards these management questions. What level of suppression is necessary to achieve desired effects and where and when should suppression efforts be focused? Uh, these are some of the management questions that were from the notification of funding for this uh, non-native aquatics. And uh, so that is um, what's driving our research in in order to understand the efficacy of suppression, we need to understand the basic ecology of crayfish uh, and the communities they're invading. So here in the Southwest, there's surprisingly very little data on just basic crayfish ecology uh, here in a host system where there's no natural analog to a crayfish, which is a large bodied uh, omnivore. And so their effects in the food web um, really are, are unpredictable, could be fast um, and are largely just unknown. So to get after these questions, uh, we uh, will conduct three different studies at three different scales in order to address those questions. Um, first, we're gonna look at fish and invertebrate communities on the landscape scale to look at what effect crayfish density has on those communities composition. Uh, this is a really data rich study that leverages 10 years of data at 16 different sites, giving us a lot of potential to understand uh, crayfish effects across the region. Uh, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of compounding factors that muddy the signal on such a large study. Um, and so to gain some sharper inference, we're planning a suppression reach study at the Tularosa River in Catron County. It's part of the San, Fr San Francisco drainage. Um, here we have two approximately 300 meter reaches where we are removing crayfish for four months um, and uh, marking and returning crayfish to the stream in the control reach for the same four months and doing some food web 
analyses at the end of that. Um, to gain even sharper inference, because this is not a study that has replication, it takes so much work and effort involved in, in maintaining the suppression um, that we're only doing it at that one stream, uh, but we're embedding some mesocosm experiments into that suppression reach study in order to sort of sharpshoot some interactions between crayfish and invertebrates and get some more causation uh, rather than the correlation that we have in the larger reaches. So getting into it, the first study that we're going to talk about today is the community composition study. Um, like I said, this takes uh, 10 years of data from 16 different sites. Um, it ends up with about 250 invertebrate taxa uh, with biomass estimates associated with that and about 23 fish species. Uh, we're, and I just had a little blowout here of the, um, up by the cliff dwellings region. The, we have six sites that are up in there that are hard to see there. Um, uh, just to get an idea of what's happening up there. Um, so the goal of this study, again, is to understand the landscape-wide effects of crayfish on the invertebrate and fish communities. Um, and so we're working with some ordination techniques to, uh, to get at crayfish effects here. Uh, the first step when you're working with these is to just visualize the data and see what the patterns are. Uh, in this case, we're going with NMDS, um, which is just one of many multivariate options you could use. Uh, here, every data point that you see is a site year combination. So this is one sampling that represents one sample that represents the entire community. Um, and this flattens out all 23 axes that are the 23 fish species into two dimensions. And the unique combinations then drive where these points are. So the further a point is away from another point, the more different it is. Um, so here, for example, what you can see right away is that uh, Sapio Creek is drastically different than the other communities. Um, and if you want to know why, we go back and look at the data and see, okay, there's a really high abundance every year of uh, Rio Grande sucker here, much more than the other sites. So Rio Grande suckers are really driving this difference. Um, and so we can do that with every, every different site that we see. We can figure out sort of, okay, what are the differences in these assemblages? Um, and then down the road, we can, uh, account for the abiotic and biotic factors and some statistical tests. So looking at what covariates drive this variation. Um, that's the goal with this project. It's one that has data in hand already that um, is sort of simmering in the back burner until we get a nice, nice multivariates too at the end of my dissertation here to present to y'all of what crayfish are doing in that larger scale. Um, so next is the suppression reach study. Um, this is one that we went out and attempted this year uh, in 2020. Uh, we had some small funding from our school and uh, went out with the field tech uh, for one week at a time every other week from March until the end of June uh, with uh, some active, we, we uh, actively electroshocked for crayfish and removed. And then we every week put out 60 minnow traps in each uh, 300 meter reach and every crayfish that was caught in the suppression reach, we removed and euthanized. Every crayfish that we caught in the control reach uh, that was large enough to mark, we marked by punching a hole in the, or the tip of their telson, which is their middle tail fin, and returned it to the stream. Uh, and so the goal with this was to reduce crayfish densities in the suppression reach and sample uh, tissues from the primary producers, from the primary consumers, all the members of the food web that we were interested in, up to riparian consumers that uh, rely on aquatic resources and see what kind of differences we could see. So the main thing that we want to get out of this study this next year um, is to utilize the data that we're already getting uh, to describe the reproductive phenology, so the timing of reproduction in the Southwest. Uh, we think conditions here are different enough from their native range in the Great Lakes region uh, that it might affect their phenology. They might be able to, uh, to spawn sooner and have a longer growing season. Um, and uh, we think that could really help managers uh, understand when to target uh, crayfish removals, in the, you know, when in the year to target crayfish removals. Uh, we want to figure out where crayfish insert themselves in the food web. Um, and then we want to describe their demographic response to removal. So did removal work? If it didn't work for, uh, uh, did it target 
was it more effective for younger crayfish, older crayfish, all the crayfish, males, females? Um, so to answer that last one first here, this is some preliminary data. It's not all the final data yet, um, but from this last field season um, where we broke out crayfish into uh, the blue lines here are young of year, the green lines are juveniles that are under three inches, and the red lines are adults, mature adults that are over three inches. Um, and the dashed lines are the removal reach, and the solid lines are the control reach. Um, and on the y-axis, we have a total abundance. Um, and so uh, here, a couple of things I'll mention is that we started seeing crayfish spawning. We started finding females that had eggs attached to their abdomen uh, right at the beginning of April. And uh, they, started having, they started hatching and having free swimming larvae uh, right at the beginning of May. We found our last gravid female on May 31st. So they were spawning from April till the end of May and we were getting young crayfish hatching at uh, uh, May 1st and then uh, and we were able to monitor the cohort's growth rate as we went. Um, I didn't include all of that information for this, this talk today, but I did include this one because I think this has some interesting management implications because the biggest effect that we saw in removal reach was on the young of the year. Um, and there was about a 90% reduction in young of year abundance by the end of the uh, study in June. And uh, there wasn't much of a difference in the adults. In fact, there were more adults and juveniles in the removal reach than the control reach. Um, it could be a few reasons for this, but one of the leading hypotheses that we have is that they were just immigrating in from upstream we know they weren't from downstream because we never captured marked crayfish uh, in the upstream removal reach. Um, and so we think that this means that we're having immigration in from upstream downstream for adults and juveniles, but not for young of year. And that might be an interesting thing. Um, we're looking forward to see what next year brings out if it get a replication of this, because that could have profound management implications about targeting young of year uh, crayfish. Um, the other thing we want to do with this project is build a descriptive food web. So this is one where you don't understand the magnitudes of interactions, but you just get to build uh, uh, a map of what the food web looks like at your site. Um, and so here we have a hypothetical descriptive food web for a Southwest stream without crayfish, including riparian consumers that rely on those aquatic resources. Because there are a number of T&E species that definitely require an aquatic resources like narrow-headed garter snakes. For instance, for, for instance. Um, and so uh, with these, you can go out and these rely on direct observation. So you know, you see something, eat something, you take a note of that, you know that that's an interaction in your food web, or you conduct a a, a, a gut content study or SCAD analysis. Um, in our case, we are going to utilize stabilized token analysis. Um, here, uh, just very briefly, I'll go over nitrogen. Uh, content and tell, tells you uh, the trophic position of an organism and the carbon axis will tell you what primary production sources are relying on. There's often a discrimination between uh, different primary uh, production resources. And also in a stream system, you can have a third axis, it's hydrogen that we're gonna utilize. That'll tell you whether a consumer is relying on in-stream derived or uh, terrestrially derived resources. So with this, our goal is to map out exactly where crayfish fit in when you put them into the system. Um, and this is really the big unknown because crayfish are a uh, really fast growing omnivore. They only live for three years. So the first year they put on a lot of mass and sort of the standing notion is that because of that, they have a higher quality diet. And so they're more predaceous than the adults that sort of take a back seat are maybe a little lazier for whatever reason, have a lower quality diet and eat more plant material. So they may occupy a few different places. They may compound their effects uh, in these two different um, trophic positions, or they may sort of mitigate the effects of, of each other. And we just don't know what that is. So that's the major goal from this is sampling the stabilized topes, looking at lower crayfish density, what does that food web look like? Looking at the higher crayfish density, what does that food web look like? Uh, and then lastly, uh, in that suppression reach study, we are embedding these mesocosm experiments so here we're going to put in varying density of crayfish into enclosures in the stream and we are going to uh, record uh, insect emergence out of those traps 
uh, on five to every four weeks through that. So these are what those enclosures are gonna look like. Uh, we're building these down at a, a metal shop south of Albuquerque um, that we're gonna dig in the bottom of the frame and recover with uh, substrate from the stream and allow that to inoculate for about three weeks, which should be plenty of time. Other literature, other experiments have let this go for a couple of days and found no difference between the substrate in their enclosure and outside. Since it's gonna be in February when we do this, we're gonna give a little more time. Um, and then we will put the outside of the enclosure down in and lash it together, stock with crayfish and close it off. Every four weeks when we go to sample, we'll put this emergence trap on top, which is just a mosquito net um, with the only exit being uh, your sampler with some ethanol in it. And so it's amazing how well this works and inverts come out, go straight into there and you have your sample. So the goal here is to answer the questions, are there differences in abundance of emergent insect taxa due to crayfish density? And also are there differences in the biomass of the emergent insects due to crayfish density? Um, and because we're so interested in that lateral subsidy, the, the riparian uh, consumer reliance on aquatically derived resources and how crayfish might affect that, um, that's the, the target in the food web that we're after. We're, we're interested in understanding how the insects respond to the crayfish. Um, so this is what that looks like. We're gonna have six replicates total. We'll divide those up between the two reaches and we'll randomize where they go in the stream um, to, to uh, randomize the, the abiotic effects of stream flow and uh, oxygen and temperature, et cetera. Uh, we'll sample every four weeks. And so we'll have five total samples because we'll start at, at time equals zero. And uh, we'll test for differences in between every one of those uh, or within every one of those sampling events. Um, we're also embedding in here a pseudo control or pseudo treatment where we are going to install the bottoms of the mesocosms but not the cages uh, within the suppression reach and uh, collect insect emergent data from that as well and so we'll get a, a reach level density effect on emergence of, of invertebrates um, and so we're hoping with that that we really sort of tie in the mesocosm uh, uh, really statistical, statistical uh, results that we get with our broader reach experiment. Um, and again, the goal of this one is to build the other type of food web that you can build or another type of food web we can build that's interaction. So here we look at the magnitudes. Now this looks really complicated. There's a lot of arrows and this is kind of simplified because I've put them into functional groups, um, but even simplified, it's really complex. And there are a lot of interactions to try to, to account for and so we had to choose which ones we're gonna sharpshoot. Uh, so like I said, we decided to go with invertebrate larva because it encompasses, or emergent invertebrates because it encompasses so many of these functional groups um, and it incorporates uh, several in-member uh, consumers. Um, and so with this, what we're trying to do is figure out when you put crayfish in, how does that affect the magnitude of interactions um, of, of your food web? And so with that, again, I'll just remind everybody to sort of sum it up. These are the three, uh, three studies we're going for. We wanna understand what's happening on the community scale uh, across the landscape. And we wanna understand what happens when we lower crayfish density, uh, how that affects the uh, descriptive food web. And we also wanna understand sort of the interaction, the magnitude of interactions between crayfish and invertebrates. Um, Looks like I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go through my thank you slide too much, except for to thank all the collaborators that helped me get this project together. Uh, I've relied on a lot of advice from a lot of people, uh, and I really appreciate it. So thanks, and if there's time for questions, I'll take the questions. Awesome. Thanks, Gregor. Um, I do want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for the second presentation, um, and uh, as needed, Alex, we can send out some of our information and a follow-up email after this too. But I, I do want to make sure that we give folks a couple minutes for questions. If anybody has anything they want to ask, feel free to jump on in the chat or just uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and I can obviously open anything. I am here. It's not just the forest. If anybody has any questions for Gregor or Tom, feel free to jump on. Hey, Gregor. Uh, long time no see. Hey, Drew. Uh, good. Good, good presentation. I mostly just wanted to say I really liked the, the, the suppression dimension of the study, like 
exploring those treatments just from my own perspective as a manager and administrator this just a, it gives us an evaluation tool to to look at you know what 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 the what the effects of are of actually removing them like how we actually say does this work like are we achieving what we want to achieve that's so I'm, I'm really pleased that that's a dimension that's in there Thanks for that comment, Drew. Um, you know, another dimension here is uh, it does specify these interactions, which can be built into other models and simulation tools. So we're real interested to see what um, Merrill MIMS has to present on the smart sim. But this is the kind of information that we think is really important when you're thinking about, you know, whether it's worth it to do a suppression, whether, you know, those kinds of things. So we appreciate your comment. Thanks, Drew. Um, Anyone else want to jump on with questions or comments? All right. Well, um, one thing I will chime in with here, um, you know, one reason that we want these presentations to be uh, be provided to you all in this group. If you guys have feedback um, that that you think could help improve the usefulness of the study outcomes. Uh, feel free to provide that here, follow up with them with Gregor and Tom separately or any of the other PIs. Uh, one of the things we tried to reiterate multiple times in the call for proposals is that these are supposed to be, um, you know, collaboration with you all and with this group is one of the key components of the project. So uh, please don't be shy if you have feedback you'd like to provide either, either today or as we go forward. Okay, not seeing any other questions right now. If we have time at the end, we can loop back. Um, but otherwise, I think we'll hand it over to um, Jennifer and, and Matt. All right, hey everybody, can you hear me okay? See the screen here? Yep, looks good. Awesome, all right. Uh, thanks, Matt, for uh, the introduction. So just to give you all a, a brief introduction of myself. So my name is Matt Troya. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, primarily uh, or historically, I'm, I'm a, a fish ecologist, um, but be dabbling into some uh, crayfish work here. Um, a lot of techniques I've used in the past are, are generally uh, uh, field sampling uh, techniques, um, deploying uh, big networks of in situ sensors to uh, monitor things like stream temperature and as you see uh, further in this study, uh, some uh, uh, inter stream intermittency. Um, and then I've worked a lot with big uh, open source data sets and modeling species distributions, which you'll see uh, those themes in this talk. Um, before I jump into it, uh, I want to give um, my uh, other PI on this project. Uh, Jen Smith, uh, the floor here to just introduce herself. Jen, you want to hop in there? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, hey, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, we're really excited to be part of this network. So I'm Jen Smith. I'm also an assistant professor at UTSA uh, here in San Antonio. So my background uh, is mainly in wildlife ecology. So my lab looks at the effects, or it takes a mechanistic approach, I should say, to understand global change effects or mainly terrestrial um, taxa. I was trained to be an ecologist, um, but I work across taxa now. So we look at the effects of global change on things like uh, spatial ecology, uh, demography and behavior of wildlife. So my um, research integrates uh, statistical approaches such as SDMs and occupancy analysis, uh, GIS, and um, it has a large fieldwork um, component. And so this is my kind of first, well, one of my first forays into the aquatic world. And Matt and I have actually been doing a, a project in San Antonio, understanding the effects of urbanization um, on crayfish. And that kind of, um, you know, sparked our interest in crayfish, which gave us kind of a, a foundation to kind of um, apply for additional funding to do some more crayfish research. Um, so as Matt said, he's going to give the presentation. So I think that's all from me. And I hand it over to you, Matt. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, so can you all see uh, the screen here and see the uh, uh, pointer hand here? Okay, cool, thanks. So um, 
just to provide a, a kind of brief uh, bulleted overview of, of what our project is going to entail. Um, so it's going to be a combination of, um, as we kind of insinuated with both of our introductions, uh, some field activities, um, and we'll be using data collected from those field activities uh, to do uh, several computational activities and different statistical techniques. So as far as field goes, um, our, we're taking a very broad scale approach. Um, we're going to be doing presence absence uh, surveys of crayfish across uh, 108 sites throughout um, southwestern New Mexico and um, most of southern Arizona, so encompassing um, nearly the entirety of the uh, Gila River system and then portions of the lower Colorado River system, mostly north flowing drainages of the uh, lower Colorado River system. I'll show you some maps in, in, a, in a bit here of where we're, we're planning on working. Um, so we'll be doing these uh, surveys uh, each summer of 2021, 2022, and 2023. We're going to pair uh, those crayfish surveys with uh, monitoring of stream intermittency at those uh, same sites. Uh, so by deploying stream temperature and conductivity uh, loggers, which I'll elaborate on a bit later in the, in the talk here. We're going to be using those data um, for developing uh, statistical models and in turn using those statistical models to map out the probability of occurrence uh, for crayfish. Um, so based on the uh, National Hydrography data set, NHD, um, our study area, which again encompasses the Gila system and most of the lower uh, Little Colorado River system. We're talking about 61,000 total reaches, although um, the vast majority of those, I think about 90% of them or so would be classified, at least according to um, NHD medium res as being uh, intermittent. Um, but that's one of the questions we're, we're hoping to tackle um, with this other aspect of the modeling study is to see if we can use uh, GIS based correlates to um, to uh, predict uh, perennial uh, versus intermittent flowing reaches. The third aspect of the modeling, uh, the computational component is going to be uh, taking this broad scale approach to try and understand uh, interactions between non native crayfish and uh, native species of greatest conservation needs. So we're going to take this uh, null model approach where we're going to be looking at um, uh, essentially trying to categorize crayfish as being um, uh, segregated or aggregated um, with uh, the, the native species and then using some null model tests to try to understand if there are significant patterns of co-occurrence or not and then using uh, ecological traits of those different native species in this the uh, crayfish to try to infer what, in, what kind of ecological interactions are, are driving that. So for example, uh, predation, competition, um, or if there are no uh, biotic interactions and it's um, uh, shared or, or, or separate uh, abiotic habitat associate, associations that, that drive those patterns. Um, so what's motivating this project um, is there's sort of two aspects to this. The first is um, just trying to understand actual um, or potential distribution of crayfish. So potential distribution, um, crayfish have been there in, in, in New Mexico and Arizona for a while, um, but whether they've fully filled out their, their, um, their fundamental niche or whether they're still being able to spread into new habitats is, is something that's somewhat unknown. A lot of what's driven, driving this, this uh, lack of knowledge is, is a, a consistent um, uh, presence absence data set where we, we have confidence absence locations. Um, and so just to kind of illustrate this, this is the um, one of our, our sub basins where we'll be sampling. This is the Black River system in um, East Central Arizona. And uh, these red uh, pink dots here represent presence only locations that were provided by uh, Dan Sorensen from Arizona Department of Game and Fish. Um, and you can see um, there's, there's definitely differences in, in presence uh, records, but whether that's related to um, inconsistent sampling across the landscape. So for example, in the um, southern portion of the upper basin, there's uh, no presence records based on these data. Um, whether presence uh, is, or whether it, the species are indeed absent there or not is, is something that we're hoping to uh, figure out. 
Um, and then there's also obviously access um, things that drive the distribution of these records too. So um, there's a large tract of uh, tribal land in the lower portion of the basin. So um, very limited um, state and federal data in, in that area. Um, kind of from a more conceptual standpoint, um, we're interested in, in trying to understand uh, the granillion or the environmental niche of uh, uh, the two species. So we'll be working with uh, Faxtonia spirillus, so the uh, northern or virile crayfish, which is um, much more widespread throughout the state, and then um, Procambarus clarkii, the red swamp crayfish, which is a little bit more limited in distribution. Um, so the other obvious motivation from a much more of a practical and management standpoint um, is trying to understand the impacts of uh, both species, uh, so Virilis and Clarkii, on, uh, on native species. So um, primarily aquatic species, invertebrates, fish, um, reptiles, and amphibians. So there's a, a variety of studies that have um, demonstrated negative interactions with native species over the past um, 20 years or so. Um, so uh, field experiments have documented competition, for example, with um, native flannel mouth, mouth suckers and uh, virile crayfish. Um, demographic studies, uh, monitoring populations and age classes of Sonoran mud turtles have uh, indicated that um, direct predation on turtle hatchlings by crayfish may be driving um, population dynamics and population declines uh, of uh, this herp species. Um, and then uh, crayfish have also been documented through a variety of uh, field observational studies and, and field manipulations um, that uh, there's significant food web and uh, habitat alterations happening with crayfish that are having major impacts on, on um, uh, really the base of the food web. So uh, macro and vertebrate communities and, and aquatic systems. Um, and those ultimately are gonna be playing up to uh, or scaling up to affect uh, higher trophic levels. Um, so those are the motivations of, uh, of the study. Um, so moving into kind of where we're going, um, what we've done so far as far as prepping for the study and where, where we're going um, to be working um, over the next uh, few months and then next uh, several years. So this is our, our study region, as I mentioned, we're in the uh, uh, Gila River system and the um, Little Colorado River system. So a bit of the, the system is gonna be here in um, Southwestern New Mexico and then uh, primarily throughout uh, Arizona. Well, we're gonna be sampling uh, 11 sub-basins. These are approximately equal to um, hydrologic unit code uh, eight resolution, so the Huck eight watersheds. Um, so just going through these from sort of a clockwise perspective, starting with the upper Gila system, um, we'll be uh, sampling there, um, moving into the San Francisco system, uh, San Pedro, uh, Santa Cruz, Verde, uh, Tonto Creek, um, Clear Creek, Chevron Creek, uh, Silver Creek, um, the upper Little Colorado system, and then the uh, Black system coming into the uh, Salt River. Uh, so parenthetically, these are the, the distribution of, of the number of sites that we'll have across these different areas that are approximately uh, equal to, or approximately proportional to the size of the basin and the amount of, of perennially flowing water um, and so just to kind of demonstrate what, how we're choosing these sites. So we want to have sites that um, have samples of uh, native non-crayfish species, um, sites obviously that are, um, that are, uh, haven't been sampled before or logistically um, accessible and whatnot. So just to give this example again, um, from the upper Black River system, there's uh, seems to be a paucity of, of, of presence data in the southern portion of the, uh, of the uh, upper basin. So we'll, we'll be deploying sites there as well as other tributaries where um, there aren't presence data. We're um, continuing to work with a lot of uh, uh, state and uh, federal agency folks to try to understand um, what we do know about presence locations. Um, so we'll probably be refining these points um, within sub-basins and across all the sub-basins. 
um, over the next uh, few months or so. And this is something where I think the community of practice that um, we're working with here, um, I'm sure you all have uh, a lot of insight that we'd, we'd love to have your, your perspective um, on how to distribute these sites in a way that um, maximizes their, their efficacy. <clears throat> um, so really the goal with building these species distribution models, having robust species distribution models is having um, complete environmental coverage. Um, so we did a, a quick GIS analysis um, showing uh, the distribution of um, what we think are probably gonna be important variables in predicting distribution. So things like precipitation, temperature, um, runoff, which is gonna be a combination of uh, evapotranspiration and, and precipitation. Um, and then some land use, landscape variables uh, like forested catchment and whatnot. So the gray areas here show the background environment. So all 60 or so thousand uh, NHD reaches. Um, and we're looking at the frequency of uh, different pre precipitation levels. Um, and then the green show those candidate sites that were in the map um, previously. And so overall, um, our candidate sites are, are general, generally representative of the background environment, which uh, is, is a good thing for being representative of what kinds of environmental conditions are available to crayfish in the, uh, in the Colorado, lower Colorado River system. Um, notice that we are kind of trending um, towards uh, wetter, uh, cooler, and um, sort of more perennial or higher elevation forested sites. Um, and it's sort of a way of erring on the side of caution to get perennial sites that, um, that aren't going to be completely dry when we uh, go out to sample in, uh, in uh, the summertime prior to the monsoon season. So um, jumping into um, our proposed field methods. So again, we're, we're going to be focusing on the two uh, species that are, are generally established and uh, uh, having impacts, um, uh, ostensibly having impacts on, on native species. So virile crayfish, uh, red swamp crayfish. Um, so we're still uh, kind of refining some of our methods that we want to use for, for uh, sampling. What we do know is we'll, we'll be deploying active sampling techniques as opposed to uh, passive techniques like uh, trapping, for example. Um, we'll be using um, some sort of uh, seining or quadrat sampling, um, either kick seining or, or electrofishing, um, to get uh, good estimates of uh, occupancy in approximately meter square quadrats. Um, and so we'll be sampling using sort of this nested spatial design. So if we have our stream reach here, um, we'll, we'll distribute these quadrats, um, replicate uh, at least five times in each habitat unit. So riffles, pools, um, side channels, or backwater areas uh, if they're present. And so we'll be using these um, replicates here in, in our uh, occupancy modeling framework uh, as, a, as a substitute for um, temporal replicates. So we can essentially estimate, uh, assuming that occupancy is the same within um, a habitat unit, we can um, infer detection in each of the different habitats um, and within the entire reach and understand um, what kinds of environmental, uh, in-stream environmental factors affect both detection and uh, occupancy. So um, the other component of our field, field method here is going to be um, flow intermittency monitoring. So we're um, building these uh, stream temperature and conductivity or stick loggers. Um, they're Hobo loggers, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, and these particular ones um, are able to monitor temperature and light. So there's actually a little uh, sensor here that measures light. And you can do a pretty simple uh, modification and um, solder a couple of electrodes um, into the, the logger here and replace the light sensor with those electrodes. And so essentially, you're getting a measure of conductivity um, or whether there's water present or not with a logger. So we've done this with a subset of, of these loggers um, in, over the last couple of months, um, tested them out in, uh, in just a, a bucket of water um, sitting outside. And we get pretty, pretty clear data demonstrating um, whether there's water present or not. So 
temperature cycles are um, much um, lower from day to night um, when there's water present compared to when there's not water present. And then there's a big obvious difference in this measure of relative conductivity. So um, much more um, electrical current flowing between the electrodes when the water's present and then essentially none when it's dry. So we've got to build a bunch more of those. Um, we'll be deploying these um, in these PVC housings, um, cabling them to um, structures in the stream where they'll hopefully be hidden and um, secure uh, for the duration of the study. And we'll be deploying them at um, multiple locations within um, the, the reach. So trying to get at whether um, there's actually water flowing, um, for example, through riffles uh, or if side channels are, are um, maintaining water or deep pools are maintaining water um, within these reaches. So moving on to what our anticipated uh, data analyses and, and data products are gonna be. So um, we'll combine our presence absence surveys across all of our sites um, with our uh, measures of uh, flow, uh, flow variability. Uh, we'll combine those with existing uh, GIS data sets. So um, the StreamCat data set, for example, has things like land use, elevation, uh, geology, and soil. So we'll use all those variables um, to fit statistical models to um, understand what environmental drivers there are for um, presence absence of our two crayfish species. So we'll take a, a uh, Ensemble modeling approach, we'll use multiple techniques, so kind of standard logistical regression techniques, um, and then some other um, more uh, recently developed techniques, uh, machine learning and, and whatnot. Um, so the output of this is uh, hopefully going to be accurate models um, that predict uh, probability of occurrence for our crayfish. Um, so a map that would potentially look something like this, although this is just a map showing, uh, I think this is just showing um, the inverse of uh, runoff or, or temperature, um, but essentially a map for all 61,000 uh, reaches within the, within the uh, study area. Uh, again, the second part of our, of our uh, data analysis is going to be understanding co-occurrence patterns. Um, so this basic null modeling framework where we're looking at pairs of sites and then pairs of species, so specifically crayfish matched up with uh, a native species and looking at uh, across not just two sites, but every pair of sites that we've sampled, um, whether the crayfish and native species are, are aggregated um, or whether they're, they're segregated. So whether you have um, these non-checkerboard or checkerboard uh, patterns. Um, we can subject this to a null model analysis then to test for significant patterns of aggregation or segregation um, between crayfish and each of the, um, the, uh, the species of greatest conservation need, which um, based on our, our initial calculations with existing data, there's about uh, potentially 31 species of um, fish uh, and herp within our study region. Um, and from that, we'll be able to come up with um, uh, an, uh, estimate of what the inferred relationship, um, negative relationship, or, or potentially just um, uh, habitat difference there is for, for these um, crayfish and the native species. Uh, all right, um, so that's what we have so far. Um, again, we'd love to have suggestions. If you guys have questions, we'd be happy to answer them um, now, or if you wanna shoot us an email, um, here are two email addresses. I want to thank U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, funding this, particularly uh, Matt Graybaugh and uh, Matt Boji, and then uh, a whole variety of folks from uh, state agencies in New Mexico and Arizona have been helping us out a lot with um, kind of planning field methods and, and site distributions. So if you guys have questions and we have a few minutes to do that, I'd be happy to take them. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, there's a few questions in the chat, but um, I'll go ahead and read them out just so they make the, the recording here. Um, there's a couple of questions about eDNA, but let's go there next because I want to make sure we uh, talk about some things that are definitely specific to the project first. Um, so Shala uh, Headwell had a question about uh, sampling, if it's only within riverine sections or if you're also going to be sampling in earthen stock tanks in the drainages. Um, 
And Shala, feel free to jump on if you want to talk about the significance of that, or uh, Matt, if you want to just uh, tell us if you if you guys considered you know looking at the isolated waters as well. Yes, yeah, so I can give a quick answer, and then uh, if you want to follow up with a question, that's that's cool too. So yeah, we, we did consider it, and it's something we've kind of grappled with whether we should try to include both types of aquatic habitats or not. Um, right now, we're we're planning on. Uh, focusing on lodic systems, weightable streams, um, recognizing that a lot of herps um, do use uh, cattle tanks, so that'll that'll be a limitation of our, our data set. Um, but we'd be curious to know what what folks think of that. So, well, one of the points I just wanted to get it is sometimes, especially with some of the. Um, LCR drainages that I'm super familiar with and where we know we have a lot of crayfish, where sections dry, we know they have source populations in earthen stock tanks nearby. So we're in an extended drought. We've got sections of stream that are really dry in some of those areas. And you may not, depending on what happens, hopefully we have an amazing winter and there's lots of water again. But um, they're, they're definitely there in some areas, but you, seasonality and um, uh, long-term drought can affect the hectability in some of those areas. So just something to think about. Yeah, for sure. And that's um, something that we've talked about in the planning and, and haven't, um, I didn't actually bring up in this talk here is, is adding predictor variables to our, our species distribution models that incorporate proximity to potential um, refuge habitats, so stock tanks. Um, my understanding is it might be a little tricky to get really good data on where stock tanks are, um, but that's something we'll probably be looking into. Thanks. I'll probably email you a couple other questions too. Appreciate yeah, it. Great, good. great presentation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm I would just second the importance of, importance of stock tanks and um, be more hopeful about good GIS locations um, and increasingly opportunities to use like remote sensing to figure out when they have water and which ones have water. Happy to talk more about that. Yeah, and, and we definitely, I think there's data sets that can help with that. So I agree with Rebecca on that for sure. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. It'd be great to get some, talk about that more in the, the coming months here. Yeah, Matt, I definitely recommend you connect with Shala. She knows this, she knows the system a little bit too <laughs> and can provide lots of I think good guidance for you guys. Um, I know we're not going to be able to, I mean, you know, do what you can within the scope of the study, obviously, but if there's a way to incorporate some of that feedback, it'd be awesome. For sure. Um, okay, looking back for questions. Uh, Tony, you had a question on which Sorensen it was, and I think it was in the acknowledgments, and I, I don't remember exactly what the context was. Uh, Tony, if you want to jump on, but I believe it was Jeff Sorensen, uh, Matt, that you guys have been working with. Yeah, uh, Arizona uh, Game and Fish Department. Yeah. Okay, I don't think there were any other questions that I saw came in that were specific to this analysis. Uh, folks can feel free to jump on if you'd like to. But what I did see though was a question about, you know, the usefulness of eDNA sampling and looking at crayfish distribution. And uh, so there were a couple things there, um, you know, at what scale that could be useful, a question about um, if there were markers available for the different crayfish species. And Tom, I saw you chimed in on that. Uh, did anybody want to discuss the eDNA piece anymore? I, I know it's not within the scope of what Matt's looking at, Matt and Jen are looking at for the study, but um, Folks want to talk about that a little bit more? You know, I, I, I have about a minute here before I jump off, but I just wanted to first of all say that's a great presentation, uh, Matt, and that's going to be a really nice uh, piece of work that's going to integrate well, I think, with uh, some of the smaller scale stuff that we're doing too. But, uh, you know, the eDNA question was motivated by, um, you know, I've seen it used at, at you know, at in tandem with these types of surveys, and it's been really useful to get presence absence type data. It may not be within the scope of this work, and you know we could talk about it, but it, it may be worth considering. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely. Um, I, I know the concept exists and, and has particularly been applied to um, invasive crayfish. So, yeah, if there is an opportunity to to um, 
collect samples. I, I don't know how time consuming what the resources are to, to get eDNA samples for all or a subset of the sites if, if um, yeah. there was an opportunity to do that. We'll look into yeah, it. I think the sampling is pretty straightforward. I think the big, the money comes into the analysis. So, uh, so anyway, yeah. yeah, and thanks again. I've got to jump off, but uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. Thanks, Tom. Likewise. Just one more comment on that. Since we have samples from all the different agencies submitted, you know, particularly to Mike Schwartz's lab, I mean, there are samples from places that we could also additionally test for crayfish, um, be from a different time frame. But there's lots of ways we could work that in if you guys are interested, I think. Sure, sure. Mike Schwartz, you said? Uh, yeah, RMRS um, up in Missoula. Great. Yeah, we'll look into that. Okay, I do want to respect people's time. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it's a little bit different uh, format for this monthly call than usual, um, but really appreciate all the presenters uh, taking time to introduce us all to your projects. Uh, appreciate the feedback we've gotten. Um, really, I think this, it's really helpful for, for the researchers, I assume, I know this will help make the products more useful for managers. And it also takes a lot of weight off the shoulders of people like myself and Matt Boji, who are not experts in aquatic ecosystems and invasive species. So uh, really all of your input's really valuable for this, so appreciate that. Um, so again, thank you to all the presenters. Um, and we will, um, I should have time to get those, the recordings edited and up on YouTube either today or tomorrow. So we'll show those out with the full community of practice. Encourage you all to continue the conversations um, offline or if uh, you see a need to uh, reconvene this group um, in our monthly calls or another event, uh, Matt, Jen, others, feel free to reach out and we can help coordinate that. So I appreciate it. Um, we had a couple other updates that I'm not uh, gonna hold you all on the call for, um, but in 15 seconds here, uh, Alex and I will be sending out some updates uh, this afternoon. Um, including a request uh, for you all to RSVP for the workshop series we have coming up for green sunfish and, and bullfrogs, if you'd like to participate in those. Uh, so look for some updates from us, uh, hopefully later today, if not tomorrow. Um, and aside from that, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Again, really great group here today, and hopefully we can keep this steam going um, into 2021. Uh, if you folks are like me, you're really excited to put this year behind and uh, look forward to good things next year. So thanks everyone for your time. Have a great rest of your week.